All right, so again, thanks everyone for joining us tonight and taking time out of your night. Tonight's speaker is Dr. Edward Rosero. He is a graduate of Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine in Philadelphia, and he completed his physical medicine and rehabilitation residency at Temple University Hospital, also in Philadelphia. Dr. Rosero then completed a fellowship in sports medicine at Christiana Care Health System in Wilmington, Delaware. Double board, double board certified by the American Board of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, Dr. Rosero specializes in non-operative sports medicine with emphasis on treatment of sports injuries, joint pain, tendon pain, and sports-related concussion. Dr. Rosero performs a variety of procedures, including joint injections and aspirations, ultrasound-guided procedures, platelet-rich plasma treatments, and EMG studies. So without further ado, Dr. Rosario, you can take it away. And All right, thank you very much. Uh, again, my name is uh, Edward Rosero. I'm here to talk to you about some of the latest advances in treating chronic tendon pain. So let me just share my presentation here. All right. All right, so let's get started. So again, what I'm gonna, my goal here is to talk about the latest advances in mostly non-operative treatment of chronic tendon pain. My overall objectives are, number one, provide an understanding of what is tendinopathy. And then afterwards, and this is gonna be the main part of the talk, is provide an evidence based review of the most common non-surgical treatment options. I do not have any financial disclosures. So let's start with an introduction. Uh, what's tendon? There are over 4,000 tendons in the body. It's a fibrous tissue, which the main purpose is to attach the muscle to the bone. And when the muscle contracts, it transmits the force through the tendon into the bone, causing a movement in the body. These tendons can be injured in a variety of ways, including sports, physical activity, or even overuse. Now, tendinopathy is a clinical syndrome of overuse, which is associated with impaired healing, resulting in prolonged pain, tendon thickening, and localized swelling, which leads to impaired performance. Now, there's a spectrum of disease that includes both tendinitis and tendinosis. Tendinitis is the acute stage of injury. This typically occurs within the first one to two weeks where there's initial acute degeneration of the tendon and acute vascular disruption of the inflammatory response, but then this usually turns around as long as there's no longer a prolongation of the injury or de defect. Tendinosis, however, that's where it becomes a chronic issue where there is now severe intertendinous degeneration. There at least to be more microtrauma. The vascular uh, supply is compromised. There ends up being scar tissue. And then there's a phenomenon called neovascularization where new blood vessels are formed. And this process really is incompletely understood. Now, looking at it at a macroscopic level, Again, tendonitis, it's the acute stage of injury where the tendon is inflamed, and this occurs and resolves in about 85 to 90% of patients. Whereas tendinosis, there is, again, a degenerative wear and tear of the tendon, which comes from a long period of process of inflammation, which actually ends up dying down. And unfortunately, this is where that small uh, population of patients, which is, ends up being about 10%, does not resolve. There may be... Um, more fibrous tissue in there, there may or may not be calcifications. And again, these really do not resolve with uh, conventional treatments. Now at a microscopic level, if you look on your left side, normal tendon occurs in these parallel bundles of what we call uniform epithelial collagen, which is oriented along a single axis. And this provides um, strength to the tendon and it provides efficiency of contraction. Whereas a chronic tendinosis, you see a lot of disorganization within the tendon at a microscopic level. The tendon appears thicker because there's a lot of production of new tendon or something we call hyperplasia. And then more importantly is that the cells are not oriented in a single direction. They can be oriented in different directions. This dis, uh, disorganization usually leads to inefficiency of the tendon and weakness within the tendon. Now, uh, with imaging, whether it's MRI or ultrasound imaging, you're going to see differences in the tendon depending on what stage you're in. With inflammatory tendonitis, the 
bundle, the tendon bundles is actually still uniform appearing, still homogeneous, but you may see a lot of inflammation within the tendon, as you can see on the left side, uh, that yellowish streak is, is what we call hyperemia, where there's a lot of fluid within the tendon. On the right side, in degenerative tendinosis, the tendon actually appears much thicker, and there may be these small hypoechoic or these less dense lesions, which could be considered a small micro tear. It's signified by that uh, pattern of uh, green dots plus the star in the middle. Now, I'm going to go through a couple common uh, tendinopathies in the body. Achilles tendinopathy, this is a uh, an injury of the Achilles tendon, which is responsible for attaching the gastrocnemius muscle or the calf muscle to the foot and ankle. This, the main purpose of the Achilles tendon is to provide force from the calf to plantar flex the foot or just to point your toes downward. And this occurs very commonly in a lot of competitive athletes and running, uh, running athletes. Most of the risk factors include, you know, in, uh, an abrupt increase in activity or increased uh, activity increased intensity activity. This could also be associated with poor running mechanics. This tends to be associated in older individuals, well, when I say older, greater than 35 years of age. There's also been some studies that associate some antibiotics, such as fluoroquinolone, in predisposing people to developing tendinopathies. Signs and symptoms of Achilles tendinopathy, and, and you're gonna see a lot of repetition in terms of these, but you're gonna get pain either in the Achilles tendon or just distal to it around the calcaneus. It tends to be worse with activity. It tends to be better with rest. Uh, there's also going to be tenderness within the Achilles tendon. Uh, just like this previous slide before, on the left side, you're going to see a normal Achilles tendon where it's very thin. Um, it's very, uh, let me get my laser point here. It's very thin. It's oriented along the same path, uh, same uh, direction and axis. However, on this side, on the right side, this is a tendinopathy where it's again thickened, and you're going to see some of these lesions within the tendon. Some what we call hypoechoic lesions, consistent with what we call some micro tearing. Lateral epicondylitis, also known as tennis elbow, is a very common um, tendinopathy. This occurs over the lateral aspect of the elbow. This happens very commonly and people do a lot of repetitive motions, but it's also been described in tennis players. Um, risk factors, again, include older age, smoking, people do repetitive motions, people do a lot of motions which require forceful activity, and finally, as we said previously, tennis players tend to get this. Signs and symptoms include tenderness over the lateral aspect of the elbow. They may be pain with resisted wrist extension or what we call supination, which is turning your hand upwards or bring your palm upwards. Patellar tendon notice, also known as jumper's knee, is a very common uh, injury in jumping athletes. This occurs in about just less than half of all jumping athletes. It's associated with not only jumping sports, but people with poor quadriceps and hamstring uh, flexibility. Some intrinsic risk factors include uh, overweight, uh, risk factors of um, abnormal angles within the knee, something called genuverum or genuvalgum. People with uh, genetically high patellas or low patellas, something known as patella alta or patella baja. Uh, there's something called an increased Q angle, which is the angle between the hip and the knee. This is something that's calculated radiographically and it's been associated uh, with people with patellar tendinopathy. Uh, increased Q angles tend to be higher in females compared to males. Signs and symptoms of patellar tendinosis includes uh, pain in the front of the knee. It's always described as aching. Again, the tendon will be tender to palpation. It may be painful at directly in the middle of the tendon or even where it, it inserts in the, the tibia or the shin bone. And again, always worse with activity, always improved with rest. Here's an ultrasound of, of a patellar tendon. Again, this is a normal tendon on the left side where it's very thin. It's oriented along the same plane. It looks very packed in and fibrillar, as we like to call it. Over on the right side, this looks a little bit thicker. And again, in this region right here, you see a nice hypoechoic region uh, consistent with a small micro tear. Within the tendon. Now, I wanna talk about a sub uh, set of, of tendinopathy, which is called calcific tendinosis. 
This is very common in shoulders and it's the presence of these calcium deposits which can be inside or outside and around the tendon. Um, this is very common in ages about 40 to 60. It's more common in female compared to males. The exact cause is highly debated, um, so they're not sure who gets this or why it gets. The leading theory is that there may be some degeneration with the tendon and then the body ends up uh, putting some crystals within the lesion that's formed. Usually it's uh, people complain of pain and stiffness within the joint, and some people also uh, report a sensation of grinding with movement of the shoulder. And one of the more important presentations, it's typically spontaneous and there's no trauma associated with it. Um, here's two examples of calcific tendinosis. This is a sh uh, shoulder joint here on the uh, left side, a left shoulder, and what you can see, this white thick density, which I'm circling right here, this is not supposed to be here. That's pathognomonic for a calcific tendinosis. Over here on the right side, this is a right shoulder, and similarly, it's this, uh, another calcific tendinosis, not as thick as the other one. Now, this is our kind of diagram about how tendinopathy progresses from tendonitis to tendinopathy, as well as our pathway to how we go about treating it. Initially, uh, someone's gonna complain of pain within a certain tendon. Based on the history and clinical exam, uh, we'll diagnose it with either tendonitis, tendinosis. If it's tendonitis, we try to do it with the conventional methods, which is rest, ice, so maybe some over-the-counter anti-inflammatories and physical therapy. And again, as stated before, 85, 90% of these people will heal and they'll be just fine. The other 10 to 15% end up having persistent knee pain, persistent uh, tendon pain, and, and which then you can either continue with concerted treatment, you can do advanced imaging to diagnose tendinosis, and that's when you get into these more advanced treatments, which we're gonna talk about. These can include steroid injections, uh, more physical therapy, platelet-rich plasma injection, needle fenestration, possibly um, tenotomies, and if that, fails, then there's always surgery. But, you know, surgery, that should be the last resort and it's something we try to avoid in patients. And what is important is people with chronic tendinopathy with, without any intervention can take about two years to heal. Now, here are the various treatments for chronic tendinopathy that, that have been reported. Honestly, this could probably be a three-hour lecture to, that we're trying to shrink down to 30 minutes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to focus on the most common most talked about treatments, which are the ones on the left side. These include physical therapy, cortisone injections, NSAIDs, also known as non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, percutase needle tenotomy, platelet-rich plasma therapy, as well as percutase fasciotomy and surgical tenotomy. And this is gonna make up the, the crux uh, of, our, of our treatment. So let's get started. So first thing we're gonna start with, one second here. Sorry about that. So we're gonna start with physical therapy. So physical therapy typically comes in three parts. Number one is activity modification, which is removing the patient from the activity which is causing pain or decreasing their volume. And this can always this is as effective if it's done early on, especially if you diagnose the tendonitis or tendinopathy, and you start with this. Secondly, it leads to biomechanical modification, which is altering specific movements, or at least taking advantage of ergonomics to optimize their movement, therefore reducing the stress on the joint. Finally, the most important part of physical therapy is eccentric exercises. Now, eccentric exercise is a careful application of load to lengthen the muscle. Most of the time when we think of contracting a muscle, it's causing the muscle to shorten. So you, you put a force to the muscle, it causes the muscle to shorten. Eccentric exercise, the purpose is to put a force to the muscle, but lengthening at the same time. The thought behind this is it causes the tendon to remodel from a state of disorganization to reorganization. And in addition, it's thought to diminish the neovascularization, which is, is, appears in most tendon, tendinopathies. If you look at the video here that, was, uh, that I have here of this uh, athlete performing eccentric exercises, what she does is she uh, raises her heel in a, about a one second count, and then she slowly lowers it over a three to five second count. What this effectively does is put a force through the muscle, causing it to contract, but lengthening it at the same time. The big question is, does it work? Well, there's been several studies which shows it does. 
Um, one study done in 1986 early on showed a, a group of 200 athletes using this alone uh, reported significant improvement in their symptoms. In addition, with Achilles tendinopathy, it's been widely effective in re reduction of pain. And then also, if done in, say, a three-month training program, people have noticed improvement of their symptoms as early as six weeks, but lasting at least a year. Now, included in, in uh, physical therapy is, I, I include splinting, taping, and bracing. Now, to date, um, there's been no studies demonstrating support for just splinting, taping, and bracing alone as being superior to eccentric exercises. Now, I'm not saying that it's inappropriate to use splinting, taping, and bracing for people with tendinosis. It definitely has a role, but it should never be used instead of, instead of therapy. There's a lot of braces that are there for uh, tennis elbow. There are a lot of braces that are there for jumper's knee. And I, I, I advise them, I, I advise my patients when appropriate to use them, but it should, I never will ever say use this instead of the physical therapy. Now, cortisone injections. This is almost the mainstay of most orthopedic practices. Cortisone injections have been widely used for a variety of musculoskeletal issues, including tendon pain. Uh, they're still used widely today by a lot of orthopods, hand surgeons, sports medicine physicians like myself. The question is, is it effective for treating uh, chronic tendinopathy. This was a, um, a systematic review to summarize the effects of steroids on tendons. It's looking at it at a, at a microscopic level. Um, what they were mainly looking at is see, number one, it, does it help with collagen organization? As I said before, that collagen gets disorganized uh, with chronic tendinopathy. And number two, you wanna look at mechanical properties. Does the tendon become stronger or weaker after cortisone injections. As I stated previously, with chronic tendinopathy, the tendon tends to become weaker. Now, there were, of the studies that were, were done, six of them showed loss of collagen organization, which is something you're not looking for in, tendinop in chronic tendinopathy. Number, secondly, uh, three studies showed increase in collagen necrosis, uh, which is, means cell death. 17 studies showed that proliferation and viability of the fibroblasts, which is the tissues, um, was reduced. So you're, you're showing less, less increase in uh, tissue production. And then you're gonna see that in uh, three other studies, uh, apoptosis, which is cell death, was unaffected, but increased in three other studies. So it was increased in three and unaffected in another. So in terms of collagen organization, cortisone injections don't seem to be helpful. Now, in terms of mechanical properties, this is a force plot, but just to kind of summarize what it showed is that out of all 18 studies that were looked at, only three really showed improvement in mechanical properties. Six showed decreased mechanical properties, which includes you know, strength, energy load, and stiffness. And then nine showed no difference between pre and post treatment. So in summary, there were negative effects of the tendons in vitro, there was increased collagen disorganization and necrosis in vivo with reduction in mechanical properties. So in summary, there really is no benefit for, cort for cortisone injections in treatment of chronic tendinopathy. Now, I'm not saying that cortisone injections are bad and should never ever be used, but in terms of if you have a diagnosis of chronic tendinosis, chronic uh, tendon tears, cortisone injections just don't seem to play a now, grouped together with, tendon, with uh, cortisone injections is non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Um, because chronic tendinopathy is a chronic degenerative disease without evidence of acute inflammatory issues, I expected, we expect similar results with anti-inflammatories, and that's what the, the, these show. So without going too in-depth into all these studies, all of them really show no improvement with use of an, non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs with the treatment of people with a diagnosis of chronic tendinopathy. Well, one study did show some short-term benefit with analgesia, but it really didn't change the diagnosis, didn't really fix the symptoms. So now moving on to more invasive treatments. This is called percutaneous needle tenotomy. Percutaneous needle tenotomy is an, un it's an uncommonly used technique in treatment of chronic tendon pain. What happens in percutaneous and tenotomy is the affected area is repetitively needled, which it's usually under ultrasound guidance, but some people do do it landmark based. And the purpose is to disrupt any type of pathologic tissue and, in, and initiate bleeding. The bleeding itself 
brings in a lot of healing factors and growth factors into the into the tissue and your and your goal is to basically turn a tissue which isn't healing into a healing tissue now this is a video uh, of of someone performing a percutaneous needle tenotomy of a patellar tendon you can see the movement of the needle in the video in the top right corner what it's what the practitioner is doing is they're uh, consistently needling uh, this area, this hypocardic area, which is a small micro tear within the tendon. And the goal is to fenestrate the needle, fenestrate the, um, the tendon with the needle approximately 30 to 50 times. And you want to make sure you, you interface at the bone. And again, the target, you always want to go for the, either a lesion, like the hyperechoic lesion that's in here, or areas of tendon thick, thickness. When you do this procedure, usually you, you, there is a tactile uh, sensation to it where you can actually feel the difference between a normal tendon, which is very soft, and a degenerative tendon, which is hard and um, it feels thicker, so to speak. Now, the big question is, did it work? Uh, now, this is a study done by this author, uh, McShane, where he was looking at percutaneous needle tenotomy. He did a previous study where he had good results with people who did uh, where he did a tenotomy plus had a corticosteroid injection on top of it. And he wanted to know if whether or not is it, is it beneficial just doing the tenotomy alone. Um, he did this with, the study was done with 57 patients, all with uh, tennis elbow who failed with non-surgical treatments, including cortisone injection, anti-inflammatories, and use of wrist splints. And what he did, he did a ultrasound guided tenotomy, percutaneous tenotomy using a small needle with a little bit of bupivacaine just to, for an anesthetization. Uh, he allowed the patients to use some Tylenol or uh, Tramadol for pain relief, but didn't want them using any NSAIDs because he didn't want to introduce any anti-inflammatories. And he wanted to look at four, uh, three things, which is pain, ability to perform tests, and overall procedure-related improvement. Now, the follow-ups were all done by telephone interview, but in summary, 80% reported no pain after one week after the treatment, and then almost 100% or 96.2% reported no painful awakenings in the middle of the night. Summarizing these two tables, the majority of patients reported no issues with functionality after the procedure. And then finally, the study showed 57% reported excellent outcome and 34% at least uh, reported good satisfaction with the procedure overall. So the conclusions of these author studies were that sonographic guided percutaneous needle tenotomy for tennis elbow is a safe and effective without any corticosteroids required. A limitation study, it was, it was a retrospective study, which means that it was, it was done after 22 month follow-up and there was really no functional abilities tested and there was no control to this, to this study. Um, this is a, a similar study which looked at percutaneous needle tenotomy treatments in other tendons. Um, these were 14 different tendons and 13 different, ta uh, 13 different patients, and it was a variety of different tendons from either patellar tendon, Achilles tendon, a proximal gluteus medius tendon, which is located over the lateral hip, the iliotibial band, and the rectus femoris. Again, it was a percutaneous tenotomy using a small needle with a little bit of lidocaine and bupivacaine for an anesthetization. And then they rested for four weeks afterwards and then returned to activity for after four to 12 weeks, and they were evaluated at four weeks and 12 weeks. And the main outcome that they were looking at was, were they still having pain? And this is a, a summary of the studies, but what it basically showed is that after four weeks, the overall pain scores, which is a pain scale from zero to 10, were cut in half, and it stayed that way for at least three months. So again, conclusion that percutaneous needle tenotomy without steroid was ineffective in reducing pain the limitation of the study is it wasn't a long-term study. It, the study didn't have all the same tendon. There was no control. There was no blinding. And the follow -up period, again, was really, really slow. And I also didn't do a sonographic follow-up afterwards to see what the tendon looked like after that. So these are my personal opinions. So in summary for percutaneous tenotomy, the pros of it, it's an effect, it seems to be an effective treatment that can actually be done in the office. The cons of this treatment, it's number one, it's invasive. It requires a needle. Number two, it's timely. Um, again, it, it takes about 30 to 50 fenestrations using a needle. And it requires a lot of precision because number one, it's a small needle that you're using. And typically this needs to be done with someone who practices ultrasound. So 
So moving on, platelet-rich plasma, which is a very controversial topic, controversial treatment for a lot of variety of musculoskeletal treatments. So PRP, or platelet-rich plasma therapy, uses injections of a concentration of the patient's own platelets to accelerate the healing of injured tendons, ligaments, muscles, and joints. In this way, PRP injections use each individual patient's own healing system to improve musculoskeletal problems. Now, just oversimplifying what PRP does, platelet-rich plasma, in, a, in effect, is the is the part of the body that helps with healing. Um, so for example, and again, I'm oversimplifying this process, is when you cut your skin and you bleed, it's a platelet-rich plasma within the blood which causes your skin to heal. And this has been used over the years to manage a lot of dermatologic issues and oral maxillofacial conditions. And PRP is very easy to obtain, it just requires the right equipment. When you have the right equipment, you take the patient's blood, you place it in a centrifuge, and then it's spun at very, very high speeds. This in turn helps separate it into the red cells, the white cells, and the platelet-rich plasma. You end up collecting the platelet-rich plasma, which is hyperconcentrated, and then you discard the white cells and the red cells. Now, the thing you have to understand about PRP is that there's a variety of systems out there. More than 40 commercial system, uh, systems ex exist, and the theory behind PRP is it induces a pro-inflammatory response to stimulate, stimulate cell growth and healing. Again, when, you, when you're in chronic tendinopathy, the inflammatory response has gone away, and what's left is degenerative tissue. So what you're trying to do is bring in some pro-inflammatory markers from the body to help stimulate cell growth and healing. Now, the big question is, does it work? So here's one study that was done. This was a large study across four academic sports medicine centers in the United States. And after the treatments, the patients were contacted to fill out surveys and questionnaires. Now, the, the patient ranges ages all the way from 18 to 75, and they had to have at least a diagnosis of some sort of tendinopathy lasting greater than six months. And it had to be image confirmed either by via ultrasound or MRI. And they have had to have failed with all concerted treatments, which we talked before, which is oral steroids, physiologic modalities such as ice and heat, and an eccentric exercise program. In addition, they can't, could not have a PRP injection any less than six months at the time they did the survey. Now, in terms of who they, they looked at, they looked at people who had PRP injections, and the PRP injections, which you need to know about them, is they can be repeated. Now, if you note at least 80% of improvement after one injections, then you didn't get any further injection. If you had less than 80% improvement, but felt you were doing better, no more injections, but if you had less than 8% and, and felt like you weren't getting better, they would then repeat the injection. Now, the number one outcome that they were looking at is whether or not the patients felt their symptoms got better at six months. And this, could, this goes from a five-point scale from either not at all, slightly, moderate, mostly, and completely resolved. The secondary outcomes they were looking at was, was pain, the, the visual analog scale, which is a pain scale that everyone goes through, which is a scale of zero pain to 10 pain, 10 being the worst. They also looked at people's functional pain. And they also looked at people's overall satisfaction with the procedure. Now, here are the results. So the good news is of the people who received platelet-rich plasma injection, at least 82% who completed the study reported at least moderate, imp moderate to complete improvement after their PRP treatments. And that's a large number, it's at least half of them saying, I, I felt better afterwards. Broken down with the exception of the patella, at least 81% by body part reported at least, at least moderate improvement seen in this table, table, data, table data below. Only people with patella tendinosis reported only about 59%. Now, in terms of who got PRP injections, of all the data that was collected, 60% only required one injection, 30% required two injections, and 10% required three or more injections. Of the individuals who got one injection, 83% of them reported moderate to complete resolution. Of the people who got two injections, 82% uh, reported moderate to complete resolution. And finally, people who got three or more injections, 76% uh, reported moderate to complete resolution. Now, of the secondary outcomes, there was a 5.2 on average decrease in pain. So if you were at 10, your pain was decreased by half. 68% reported no pain with activities or no pain afterwards. 27% reported 
pain with activities, but it didn't it disrupt their abilities to do their activities of daily living. 5% reported pain at rest, but it did not interfere with their ADLs. And then overall, 85% were satisfied, 13% were dissatisfied, and 2% were indifferent. The, the importance of the study, it was one of the largest databases of patients treated with PRP for tendinopathy. And what it showed was significant improvement of symptoms, both perceived and measured by the patient. And there was mostly a satisfactory patient perception. The limitations of this study, however, is that because it was a survey response, there it was required patients to come back and let them know how they felt. And they only got about a half, half, 55% or half of the patients really responded. And there really was no long-term follow-up. In addition, most of the patients went underwent some sort of rehab program afterwards. And the rehab program, because it was across four centers, really weren't standardized. So there, there may be errors in terms of did people get better because of better or worse physical therapy, it's still not known. And finally, they, the type of system that they use really wasn't studied. So this, the, whatever system uh, the practitioners used, it was, it was kind of at their discretion. Now, as I said earlier, PRP use for efficacy, is, it's still being debated. And there have been power studies stating that PRP is great, which I just showed you, and there's been a couple that actually showed it's, it's not that great either. One study was performed by this author in 2011, and it was published in the British Journal of Sports Mess in 2011. Now, this was a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled trial. This is the gold standard of trials when you're trying to prove a point. What they did is they studied 54 patients with chronic mid-portion Achilles tendinopathy, and they split them into two groups. Each, each group did eccentric exercises, but one group got platelet-rich plasma, and the other one just got saline, which was acted as a placebo. What they were looking at, number one, they looked at they were looking at tendon structure, but they're looking at it under ultrasound evaluation. And also they're looking at any neovascularization uh, that occurs with chronic tendinopathy. And they were looking at people at six weeks, 12 weeks, and 24 weeks. So roughly this is uh, six weeks and about six months study. Now the results were they were significant improvement in both. So they both helped, however, there was really no significant difference between the PRP group and the control group, which was placebo. So in conclusion, what the author noted was that injecting PRP for treatment of chronic mid-portion Achilles tendinopathy really doesn't contribute to improvement in the tendon structure or to the degree of neovascularization. In addition, he did a similar study looking at PRP injections for chronic lateral epicondyle. He did a systematic re review looking at a lot of studies that that were out there. And six studies that were studied four were considered high quality. And the conclusion of the study was that there was really no strong evidence that PRP injections are, are efficacious in the management of chronic lateral uh, tendon pain or uh, tennis elbow. It, it basically, the author was, author was saying that in review, in review, it's just not effective. So here's a summary of PRP. What are the pros? Number one, it's safe. Typically, what you're injecting is your own body's material, so the chance of allergic reaction is completely low. It's a, is it effective? Possibly. I've shown you studies that shows it can be, can be effective, and this can be done easily in the office. Uh, the cons of it, it's, it's invasive. Obviously, we require a needle to do it. Again, a con is we're not quite sure yet, is it effective? More studies are definitely being done as we speak, but it still haven't proven that it is 100% uh, effective in treatment of all chronic tendinopathy. Finally, it's, it's expensive to say the least. Um, this treatment is not covered by any commercial insurance or Medicare at present time. So in order to even have this treatment, it, it's gonna cost an out-of-pocket expense. And the expenses can differ between what system you use and what part of the country you are in. I've seen costs as little as 500. I've seen costs as great as 5,000. It just depends on where you're going. Now, finally, I want to talk about uh, something called fasciotomy and tenotomy. This is an ultrasound guided, minimally invasive procedure, and this is done in an outpatient setting, uh, typically at some sort of at, at a surgical center. This can be done either locally with a local anesthetic or with some light sedation. What happens is this is a similar to percutaneous needle tenotomy, but just slightly more effective. What we do is you make a small five millimeter incision, which allows a larger gauge probe to be inserted. And what it does is it allows the tendon to heal and gain structure and strength. And 
on top of that, we send you to physical therapy and that also helps too. Now, what it does is it works like percutaneous needle tenotomy where we we fenestrate the tendon over and over and over again, just like percutaneous needle tenotomy, but built into the, the, the probe is a saline jet and a method of suction, which helps remove any diseased tissue. So you're not just leaving it in there to be reabsorbed by the body. You're actually not only breaking down the diseased tissue, but you're, you're also sucking it out. Um, and again, it's a, it's a very small device, but it does require a small incision just because it's definitely larger than any needle that you're gonna be using in the office. Now, there is one study done by uh, this company, Tenjet. It, it was a study of, of tendon, uh, chronic lateral epicondylosis or tennis elbow. And what they did is they followed up patients at several intervals throughout the year. There's really only two dropouts. And what they noted was that there was improvement in pain scores about 50% by six weeks afterwards. And this was at a higher rate than any other conserved treatment options. If you look at this graph, uh, pain at rest was down to half by six weeks and continued to decrease over the next 12 months. Pain with lifting heavy objects started, was down by half at six weeks and again, continued to drop over 12 months and pain with heavy objects, this is anything greater than 10 pounds. And then pain with repetitive activity, again, down half by six weeks and continue to decrease over 12 months. There was another study done by another uh, company looking at, again, fasciotomy and surgical tenotomy for lateral epicondylosis. And they were also looking at um, patient satisfaction, pain scores, something called the disability of arm, shoulder, and hand scores. And they're looking at ultrasound assessments at three and six months. And bottom line is that with each, with the with the uh, case studies, they noticed that pain dropped significantly over the first three months and continued continued on for a year. Same with the sensation of disability went down significantly after the first month. And then, even though there's no significant drop afterwards, it still continued to stay low even at a year. And then when looking at the ultrasonographic ultra features of the tendinopathy, what they did note is there's significant resolved or reduced hypervascularity or neovascularization. The tendon thickness, which you see in chronic tendinosis, was reduced significantly. And then any, any hypoechoic lesions, all but two were reduced. The last two remained the same, but none of them increased. And then with patient satisfaction, Overall, nine were very satisfied, 10 were somewhat satisfied, and one was neutral. And then with the tenotomy and fasciotomy, it's very effective because of the way it works in terms of breaking down tissue and sucking out any pathologic tissue with dealing with calcific tendinosis. These are two of my patients. Over here, you see the calcific lesion right here. After two weeks for follow-up, repeat x-rays show it was completely resolved and this patient was pain-free. This one here, this large lesion that you see right here, again, she had a uh, fasciotomy and tenotomy procedure done. And after two weeks, the lesion was completely gone and the patient was telling me she was pain free. So pros and cons of this procedure, number one, it's effective. Number two, based on the design of the tendon, there's no effect on any healthy, healthy, healthy tissue. Number three, there's immediate tactile feedback for the physician. So when doing this procedure, you're gonna, like percutaneous tenotomy, you're gonna feel the tendon as you fenestrate it, but as you remove the bad tissue, there's immediate feel of a softening of the tendon. So you know you've either removed or changed the, the tendon texture of the bad tissue. This is, I find this typically better for larger lesions, especially with calcific tendinosis. And this is a viable surgery alternative to major surgery. The cons of it, it has it typically is done in a surgery center just because there is a small incision that has to be made. And if the patient does request um, anesthetization, this, it, ha it would have to be done there. When doing fast time that it does require a period of mobilization just because you're breaking down a significant amount of pathologic tissue. And normally you do have to go to rehabilitation afterward because what the studies have shown us is that rehabilitation following this procedure makes it more beneficial. So my final recommendations are the best treatment for tendinopathy is prevention. You know, if, if you 
know that you develop tendonitis or start to develop tendon pain, you should do what you can to abate those. So if you're a runner or a jumper and you start to feel pain, what I would immediately do is stop what you're doing, see a physician or, or at least try resting it on your own, and then re restarting the process once you're pain-free. It's always reasonable to restart with an eccentric-based exercise program such as physical therapy or home exercise program. NSAIDs or even NSAIDs are good in the short term, but it's not, it's only good temporarily for analgesia. Cortisone injections I do not recommend for treatment of chronic tendinopathy. And then past that, consider more invasive procedures if conservative measures fail. So in conclusion, chronic tendinopathy is a degenerative process resulting in from overuse injury. And there's a multitude of treatment options which can exist, both conservative and invasive, and feel free to discuss it with your physician which option is best for you. All right, uh, thank you for your attention. Thanks, Dr. Rosero. I don't see any questions um, in the Q&A box or in the chat box, but if anybody does have any, um, please feel free to write those in there and Dr. Rosero can answer. We'll give it a minute or two. I apologize, my, my camera's at the left-hand bottom of the screen. <laughs> I was gonna type in the chat box here. I'm just not sure if everybody knows where the Q&A box is. <clears throat> Plug in my computer before. All right, I don't see anything coming in. Well, I see, I see them, now they're coming, I hear. <laughs> okay. Can you hear me, Dr. Rosario? I can hear you. Okay, so somebody asks, are there any supplements that help tendons? Um, right now, there's no, uh, I don't have any data that suggests that any particular uh, supplement helps with chronic tendinopathy or preventing tendinitis or tendinopathy. From a sportsman perspective, I tell this to all my athletes, short of a multivitamin, there's, there's really no data which helps prevent any type of tendinopathy. Okay. I mean, yeah. not that a multivitamin does prevent it, but it's the only thing I really recommend. Okay. Um, somebody said, my heel pain was treated with PT. I still have pain. Should I return to my podiatrist or go to an ortho? Um, I mean, it'd be reasonable to return to your, your prior treating physician, uh, uh, um, podiatrist, you know, I, I don't want to tell you not to go to someone who's treated you before, but if you are looking for a second opinion, it'd definitely be reasonable to see one of, one of us just to take a look if you need say fresh eyes on, on your condition. Okay. All right. Someone said, is the last treatment type covered by any insurance? Yes, the, the fasciotomy and tenotomy, the last ones I talked about, they are definitely covered by insurances. I don't wanna put out the blank made that every single insurance covers it, but I have yet to have any issues, at least from what the, my sculptures tell me that there's anyone that is not covered. Okay. I appear to have golfer's elbow, pain on the inside of my elbow. What's the best treatment? Um, again, it just depends on how long you've had it. You know, if it's, if it's an acute injury or even if it's a chronic injury, it's always good to start with, you know, some sort of therapy. Now, do you have to go to a form of physical therapy? Not necessarily. Uh, certainly there's some eccentric exercises or home exercises you can do on your own. Um, there's certain, there's a lot of resources out there to look at them. You know, I don't want to be remiss and pretend that, uh, Google and YouTube don't exist. Or you can start with formal physical therapy. Um, aside from that, then you kind of just follow the, the treatment plan, which I, um, which I kind of went through. But normally, if you're not getting better on your own, you really should see a physician so they can kind of help guide you through all those treatment plans. Okay. Are these procedures effective on the knee? Uh, it's a generalized statement. So if you're talking about patellar tendinosis or the, ten, the jumper's knee that we're talking about? The answer is depends on what we're talking about. 
So the ones that we talked about, uh, the, if it's chronic tendonitis or tendinosis, the answer is no for anti-inflammatory NSAIDs, no for cortisone injections, yes for physical therapy, and then the other ones, PRP, we talked about possibly. Uh, studies have shown yes, but there's been studies who have shown no. Uh, the other ones, pertinase and tenotomy, and then the fasciae and tenotomy definitely have been shown to help. If you're talking about knee arthritis, that's, that's a completely different condition and then a whole, whole different lecture. <laughs> Can you use fasciotomy and tenotomy on torn peroneus brevis and what would be period of immobilization after? Who should I see um, for this tendon at Rothman? Um, um, there's been no studies on that specific tendon. Now, the big question is, what does it look like? Now, if it's, if it's a micro tear or has tendinosis, the, the theoretically answer is yes. If it's a full severed tendon tear, um, that's something that usually would not help with it. So there's a, there's a little bit of a difference. So when you say tear, right, there's either the tendinosis, which is a tendon that has a break in it. I mean, sorry, it has tendinopathy where it's kind of thickened with these micro tears versus a tear which is completely torn. A complete tear, this wouldn't help for it. it just You'd have to just define what you mean by tear you're in that muscle. There is tendinosis and probably small tear. So the answer is yes, if this can be accessed appropriately. So you would probably need some advanced imaging to have this done. Uh, I would start by seeing one of our foot and ankle specialists first because you want to rule out other issues of pain besides that uh, peroneus brevis. And then the chat. Oh. Uh, right. Okay. Yeah, Mary. I mean, I can. I can. Um, I can actually. I'll write my email in the chat box before we log off, and you can feel free to reach out to me directly. And I'm happy to help anyone set up an appointment or a answer any questions. So I'll type my my email in the chat box. And there's a few questions coming in the chat box as well. Sure. Um. Is it correct that cortisone injections are beneficial in acute tendinitis, but harmful to tissues for chronic tendinosis? So the second part of that, in terms of chronic tendinosis, it's not so much harmful, but it's, it's definitely ineffective in treatment of chronic tendinosis. Now, in theory, it's supposed to be beneficial in chronic tendinitis as well. I mean, excuse me, acute tendinitis as well. But there's also been a couple studies that show that in acute tendonitis and certain high velocity tendons that it it has a higher risk of tendon rupture so what's been shown is that a lot of people have been avoiding doing uh, and this is very common is a lot of people are not doing any cortisone injections to any type of tendon injury these days um, because of that risk of rupture and, and i'll be honest with you, it depends on which tendon we're talking about things like the patellar tendon the biceps tendon the triceps tendon these are called high velocity uh, tendons which carry a lot of load. So cortisone injections, those they, they do have a higher propensity to rupture. So we try to avoid doing cortisone injections in those tendons. Okay. Is the fluoro, fluoroquinoline, I don't know if I said that correctly, yeah, related on. tendon problems one and done or recurring even after medication has been stopped? So the theory behind it is it should be one and done once the, the medication is stopped, but there's been some studies that show that Sometimes the four clones uh, can have some, some longer, I don't want to say chronic forever effects, but longer lasting effects. The way the four clones work is, trying to summarize it, it produces these things called free radicals, which, which are kind of damaging to the body. And the thought process is that these free radicals hit the tendon and cause them to become weak. Now, once those free radicals are absorbed, the theory is that it should go away that the, the risk of tendon injury or rupture. Okay. It shouldn't be a long lasting, but it's been definitely documented that people develop these tendon ruptures or chronic tendon pain after doing activity just short of coming off those fluoroquinolone medications. Okay, somebody said any comment on prednisone or other steroids and tendon rupture, I guess you. Uh, I mean, Prednisone, if you got to think of prednisone similar to Motrin, they're both anti-inflammatories. So in terms of 
taking an oral steroid for a tendon, there's no, been no studies that show that taking an oral steroid one time, now acutely, puts you at risk for a tendon rupture. Now, if you're on chronic steroid use for other medical conditions, you're going to have issue, uh, body issues anyway in terms of weakened ligaments, weakened tendons. You might be at risk of other bone issues. So uh, the overall answer is if you're on chronic steroids, there is a risk of, of tendon issues. Okay. Somebody asks, um, I have been diagnosed with a vascular necrosis of the left hand. Also have severe arthritis in left thumb. Tendinitis pain near thumb and pinky. I've seen a hand doctor. Can any of the treatments mentioned help me? Uh, that depends. So with the avascular necrosis, no. Um, avascular necrosis, that's, you're pretty much talking about bone death, uh, which is a different body part and treatment. Now, tendonitis near the thumb and pinky depends on which tendon we're talking about, uh, but certainly it's worthwhile looking into. The hard part about your situation, if you have a lot of uh, AV AVN or avascular necrosis in the hand, that might be, even though you have MRI findings of tendonitis or tendinopathy, that might be the, uh, the primary reason why you're having pain. It just might be more from the AVN as opposed to tendonitis. You really have to look into that um, and, and to figure out which one is the primary pain cause. Because there are plenty of people who have patellar tendinopathy, but they also have severe arthritis. If someone comes to me and says, hey, um, you know, treat my tendon tendinosis, fix my knee, I'm still not fixing their severe arthritis or the, their AV, avascular necrosis in their knee, so they're still going to have pain no matter what. Okay. Um, that was the last of it, unless anybody has anything else. Any other questions? All right, that was the last one that came in. Oh, one more. Oh, I see. Will this be sent over email or uploaded to YouTube? Yes, both. So everyone who attended tonight will receive a follow-up email, um, let's say Thursday, probably by early next week. It will be on our YouTube channel as well for future reference. And you can also you know, feel free to share that with, um, with anybody you think may benefit from it as well. Thanks for everyone for joining tonight. Thank you, Dr. Rosero, for your excellent presentation. Like Thank I said, I will, I will type in my email here. So if anybody does have any specific questions or needs help um, scheduling an appointment or has any you know, questions that they think of after we log off, um, you know, feel, please feel free to, uh, to send them in and um, we'd be happy to answer them for you. All right. Have All right. a good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.